So word is that there is a sub-analysis paper that has recently been um, submitted, and I believe accepted, um, that looked at the iliofemoral population in, in the ATTRACT trial, and that that analysis clearly shows a positive trend toward treatment, um, that there was a significant improvement in the moderate and severe PTS population, and that there was also a significant improvement in both pain and swelling in that population. So there again, there are positive things that we can take from a tract um, to allow the interventionalist to uh, use in support of why we should be doing interventions in, in certain populations. In patients with uh, central severe occlusions, I, inferior vena cava or iliofemoral DVT, who have severe symptomatology, such as uh, phlegmasia, um, despite anticoagulation and conservative therapies, they would get treated up front. However, the real question is, when do you treat patients who aren't in that category and have DVT? And so our algorithm would suggest that what we learned early on was that, for us, there was really no difference in outcomes in patients treated at 14 days, which is sort of the definition of acute DVT, and those that were treated at uh, 28 days, at one month. We had all, essentially the same results. And so what we've done with our algorithm is say, get therapeutic anticoagulation, get compression, start to ambulate and get up and move around, and see if the endogenous system in the body will help to dissolve that clot. We do serial. Uh, follow-up with ultrasound and, and office evaluation. And in, in that three-week window, we start to identify those patients who are getting better, which means we don't need to treat them, and those who are getting no benefit from conservative therapy. We allow them to declare themselves who's going to be developing PTS, and now we intervene on that population. And I think that's the appropriate way to handle the acute DVT patient. So it's important to marry industry's interest, which has been fantastic over the last five, six years, it's getting greater, um, the, the, the government's interest, which is clearly there, as well as the physician interest, the investigators, to really develop that next level of, of data. Um, I think there's a trial that's going to be starting um, uh, shortly called Clear DVT. That's industry sponsored. But I think that's going to be the, a, a great next step towards starting to get better information um, in identifying this population and seeing the benefit uh, for intervention. It is going to be looking at the acute DVT population of iliofemoral DVT patients. Um, it's really that sub-segment that we have known, we do know, uh, that is the highest risk for developing PTS. And so we're focusing really on that high-risk PTS population to see if intervention helps. Um, and, and that's what ClearDVT is really designed for. I, I think that there, um, there are uh, several uh, chronic DVT uh, trials. One's going to be C-TRACT, which will be a follow-up to a tract that will be looking at chronic iliofemoral occlusions and whether intervention helps. Um, and that's underway. Um, and then the only other one is uh, that, that really did show statistical significance is patients who, who were suffering from chronic DVT um, was the ACCESS PTS trial, looking at the ecosonic system in the, use, uh, in, the, in the use and treatment of chronic DVT patients. That study was um, overwhelmingly uh, significant, statistically significant in that the Velalta scores, VCSS scores, and quality of life scores were all overwhelmingly positive. So, you know, the message there is that if you develop PTS, there are ways of being able to treat it that we shouldn't be telling patients you got to live with it. Um, and they just need to seek out, you know, interventionalists um, that can, can help. I think what we learned a lot was from the secondary aspects of the trial such as um, younger patients are doing better with more aggressive therapy, iliofemoral are doing better with aggressive therapy, 
but um, we're also learning that when somebody starts out with a post-phlebitic syndrome, they're going to end up with post-phlebitic syndrome. And so the, any aspect, any amount of post-phlebitic syndrome is probably not a good endpoint. And so for those reasons, we can't use the first-line data as an absolute criteria of who to treat and who not to. The second-line data is much more important. I believe that a younger patient that comes in with significant leg swelling, and if it's documented to be iliofemoral, in those patients I believe they'll benefit the most, and those are the patients that I would be more inclined to treat. Every patient has to be looked at individually, and I believe that is a group that would benefit the most. So the tried and true devices that we've been using is one, a lytic infusion, but that's old school. Now we're more rapid lysis, and ECOS helped using the thrombolytics and making it a little bit faster. Uh, but now we're very much more in mechanical devices, mechanical thrombolysis, such as uh, AngioJet, using power pulse spray and trying to get the cases done earlier. We could use Penumbra, we could use Cleaner, we could use uh, Jedi, which is um, similar to Penumbra, but rather than having a plunger, it has a fluid that helps clean the catheter out. Inari is a new company that has a device um, for rapid removal of clot from both the peripheral system and from the pulmonary system. Um, and then there are other devices that are uh, coming out with large funnels and um, being able to remove large clots but are not yet available but are being um, studied. In addition, for removal of large clots, the angiovac is used to remove clot from the right atrium or large bulk IVC clot. We primarily use the angiovac for right atrial clot and we reserve the other devices for the CAVA and the iliac veins. When it comes to pulmonary uh, clot, um, we have to get better at removal of um, clot quicker to reverse patients that are having severe uh, heart strain. Um, in the peripheral vascular and the venous system, I believe that patients with more chronic disease, such as what Mark Garcia speaks about often, um, can benefit because um, their chronic debilitating venous insufficiency can be improved um, if you're more aggressive with those patients. And these are areas that need to be addressed more in randomized studies or good registries that in lieu of a randomized trial. There has been recent uh, uh, progress in the thrombectomy space. There are a lot of new exciting uh, devices that are becoming available, which addresses a large unmet current need in dealing with peripheral clot, both on the arterial and venous side, and deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and also arterial thrombosis. We have thrombolytic drugs with catheter-directed thrombolysis that have been available for decades. Why do we need thrombectomy devices in this space? Well, there are t several reasons. One is, from a pure complications perspective, thrombolytic catheters are associated with a small but definite risk of bleeding. Now, risk of bleeding in the younger patients who have deep vein thrombosis is less. In those patients who have pulmonary embolism or arterial thrombosis, that risk is a little higher. And that risk can include catastrophic bleeding like intracranial bleed. Therefore, it would be uh, a substantial progress if we could deal with the clot without the use of thrombolytic, the, uh, device, uh, thrombolytic drugs or reduce the dose of thrombolytic drug. And that is what the thrombo, uh, thrombectomy devices achieve for us. It has to match the efficacy 
of thrombolysis without obviously the complications. And if you look at the literature and meta-analyses of the outcome of thrombolytic agents, let's say in the catheter-directed thrombolysis for deep vein thrombosis, the general rule of thumb is that we have to be able to clear 80% of the clot in 80% of the patients. So we call it an 80-80 rule. And if the thrombectomy devices achieve that, they will have matched the efficacy of thrombolytic drugs. And if they do better, perfect. Of course, then you don't have the complication of drugs uh, being bleeding. The second reason, uh, an important one, for use of thrombectomy devices is to save time and money. Uh, thrombolytic drugs require hospitalization, frequently in the intensive care unit, and uh, the patients cannot be discharged the following day immediately because the drug is around. And it can still lead to bleeding. Those patients need to be monitored. With the thrombectomy devices that are now available and becoming available, we have the ability to treat deep vein thrombosis in a single session. And that is a substantial achievement. There are several uh, the exciting uh, projects in the works and some that are now available. In, uh, in particular, one that I can mention and we do have some experience with, it's called the JEDI uh, catheter uh, by Walk Vascular. They are a startup in, in Orange County, California, and that they're close to us. And so we have tried this device in over 30 patients now uh, in deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, and a handful on the arterial side. And our experience with it has been very positive. In our hands, it has been actually very good in a single session treatment. There was a Canadian study that was recently uh, uh, presented at Searcy that confirms our, our experience with it that the majority of their patients were treated in a single session and they were able to uh, reach and beat that 80-80 threshold.